just keep them on silent, please. And there will be uh, some, uh, I think uh, we have uh, our professor who will speak in Kazakh and our guests, some of them speak in English. So if you'd like translation, please, prov please try to have your own headphones. Dear audience, if you hear me, those who need uh, translation, uh, please ha raise your hand. Okay. 
Anyone who needs translation, please raise your hand. They will uh, provide you with the headset. On the third. Thank you. You're welcome. I can start. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Astana International Forum. My name is Afaf Saudi. I will be your moderator for today's panel, thinking about the next one, assessing progress on global health preparedness. Nearly 7 million people lost their lives due to COVID-19, according to WHO latest report. I, I'm sure we all recall the lockdowns, the travel bans, and the fear of the unknown that swept the world back in 2020. It was a traumatic experience for everyone, as it changed every aspect of our lives, how we work, how we commute, and how we communicate. So, are we ready this time to face the next one? To answer this question, I'm delighted to have the uh, experts on this panel. He's a biomedical researcher with pre previous affiliation with John Hopkins University. His current focus has been on prevention and management of chronic diseases. He is the president of the Academy of Pre Preventive Medicine in Kazakhstan and a member of the American Public Health Association. Please welcome Professor Almaz Sherman. He is a representative of World Health Organization in Kazakhstan has over 20 years of ex experience in addressing health issues. He helped all the governments late, lately with the pandemic of uh, COVID-19-20. Please welcome Dr. Iskander Sila. He is a medical doctor with 30 years of experience in migration health he is the advisor for IOM for Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Please welcome Dr. Chaim Calderon. She is a senior doctoral epidemiologist with the US Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and she's currently the director for uh, CDC office in Kazakhstan. She is also le leading the training in epidemiology in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. Please welcome Professor Roberta Horth. <clears throat> he is a country manager for a cluster of countries in Central Asia and he has led Pfizer in the region 
through COVID-19. Please welcome Mr. Dmitry Kozenkov. <clears throat> Last but not least, she is the prominent Kazakh scientist in the field of biological safety with 32 invention patent. And she is currently the president of the Academy of Science under the president of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Please welcome Professor Kunsulu Zakaria. So let me start with Dr. Sila as a representative for WHO. Are we ready this time to face the next pandemic? Thank you very much, esteemed panelists, dear participants. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here and to discuss together, to make a dialogue about the emergencies, but also the threat that humanity is facing. When health is at risk, everything is at risk. Over the past three years of COVID-19 has caused us all great suffering and taught us many painful lessons. We owe it to those we have lost to learn those lessons and to transform that suffering into meaningful and lasting change. COVID-19 now is over as public health emergency of international concern, but the threat of another pathogen emerging with even deadlier potential remains always. And pandemics indeed are far from only threat we face. We hear today also that climate crisis, antimicrobial resistance, communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, inequalities, all are of the nature international and no country can address them alone. That's why it's of paramount importance to have international cooperation in order to address this issue. I would like just also to highlight some key developments that have indeed pandemic urged countries to strengthen their health systems in order to be better prepared in the future. I would say that tomorrow we are better prepared than yesterday and hope with a joint work tomorrow will be better prepared than today. So the following COVID-19 pandemic, global health preparedness has seen significant improvements in terms in several areas. For example, strengthening surveillance systems. Countries and international organizations have invested a lot in strengthening surveillance system in order to detect in time new pathogens, but also to react promptly, timely, decisively, and always with community engagement. The second dimension which has seen significant improvement is global co collaboration and informing, information sharing. The pandemic has highlighted the importance of global collaboration because when one deadly virus is one, while is present in one part of the world, next day can be in the other part of the world. That's for sharing information and collaboration is key to tackle pathogens of today and tomorrow's. Research and development have been significantly advanced. The COVID-19 has led to an unprecedented focus on research and development. We all witness that the new vaccines with the new technology were developed rapidly and also of high quality, with high efficacy, and also to protect lives of the people. At the same time, there will develop therapeutics, new diagnostic tools, in order to enable to have results as fast as possible. But also, key dimension in addressing the future challenges is of strengthening health system. Without proper health system in place, we would not be able to address challenges of the future. And the other dimension is enhanced risk communication. It's clear that without proper engagement of the communities themselves from the beginning in order to create 
clear trust, to provide them clear information from the beginning, you cannot address the issue. That's why always communities should be in the center, particularly in today's world when there is a lot of misinformation and disinformation. And finally, I will end up with pandemic preparedness planning, which is at high level, WHO is leading the process in order to have new pandemic accord to be agreed by member states in which we would have clear roles and we will, we will definitely go through uh, the, uh, the steps and the practical uh, measures that were taken by uh, WHO. But uh, I, I want to go back and, and maybe simplify it for the, for, for the audience. Uh, Professor Almas, I mean, most of the people who lost their lives during COVID had chronic diseases. How this really affected and how can we make sure that this type of pattern doesn't, doesn't happen in the future. Thank you, Afaf, for this question, and uh, I really appreciate the audience for joining us uh, in this important uh, panel session. Um, uh, and uh, there's compelling evidence uh, that demonstrates that uh, uh, the severity and mortality from COVID-19 are closely associated with chronic uh, uh, non-communicable diseases. About 80% of those who died of COVID-19, they were diagnosed with at least one uh, non-communicable disease, such as uh, diabetes, uh, obesity, hypertension, uh, cardiometabolic syndrome. And uh, those disease conditions are on the rise and the same as the cost to treat those conditions. Uh, and uh, overall, the overall uh, healthcare cost uh, globally uh, could be reached uh, several uh, dozens of uh, trillions dollars, uh, and something needs to be done to address this very, very important issue. Um, uh, over the past 100 years since the discovery of, um, of penicillin, uh, medicine adhered to the practice uh, that focuses on identifying certain targets and uh, designing and using uh, 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 some um, antibiotics, antiviral drugs, uh, cancer treatment drugs uh, in order to destroy um, bacteria, viruses, cancer cells, and that's what I call destructive medicine, so that destroys. Uh, but this approach uh, didn't work well uh, during the pandemic 19. If you look at, uh, for example, uh, the uh, uh, drugs that were designed, such as remdesivir, even uh, Paxlovid, was not as effective as we expected. Uh, uh, however, uh, the, uh, what, what really worked is, is uh, the way how how uh, we can harness our immune system in order to uh, defend from, um, from COVID-19 and other viruses. And uh, here we have mRNA vaccines and very successful uh, technology that, that uh, helped to overcome this um, uh, pandemic. And this is what I call constructive medicine. Uh, and uh, constructive medicine uh, is, uh, is quite, I, I believe that this is the way how we can address non-communicable diseases. And uh, for instance, in case of uh, destructive medicine, non-communicable disease facing the same challenge. Uh, so you can design drugs, um, medications uh, that could address and could destroy certain targets if they, you can discover those targets. But those targets are moving targets. They, they, uh, uh, they're elusive and very difficult to, to destroy those targets. Uh, and uh, let's take an uh, example as uh, cancer. Cancer is not just one disease, it's 100 diseases depending on uh, what's a genetic profile of that cancer. And once you design the uh, molecule or drug that kills uh, those uh, like, you know, targets, uh, uh, it's, it could be successful, but you need to have hundreds of these drugs and uh, they, they're very, very expensive. So the solution is, is a constructive approach to, uh, to deal with, uh, to address and to manage uh, non-communicable And we will diseases. surely discuss it in details, the constructive sure. medicine. Yes. And as you were mentioning uh, the vaccines, I would like to ask the representative of Pfizer with us here. So what is Pfizer's strategy for the next few years to make sure that vaccine is available for everyone? Uh, all right, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for, for the audience for being here, and uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, on such a representative uh, panel. Uh, Pfizer indeed was uh, doing something during the COVID-19 pandemic that uh, both of the speakers before me alluded to, uh, and mostly invested early and heavily 
and at risk, to be honest, in the research and development of an absolutely novel platform of uh, vaccine and uh, tried and was successful in making a, a very uh, effective and uh, very safe and meeting all the stringent requirements of regulatory bodies across the world vaccines. At the end of the day, uh, Pfizer up to uh, May of 2023 uh, delivered to 181 countries around the world, countries and territories, uh, over four and a half billion doses of vaccine. So it became the most popular product in uh, 21, 2022. Now, in order to make it available, Pfizer also had to act with a light speed, literally with a light speed, in order to scale up the capacity of manufacturing and transportation, which, as half of you mentioned, the transportation routes were completely uh, distorted during the pandemic, but that had to be fixed. And I think uh, people in the Pfizer Glo Global Supply Organization were the, uh, the heroes of, uh, of their front as well in fighting the, the pandemic. Uh, at the same time, we have learned the lesson of uh, a rapid scale up, a very good partnership with regulatory bodies and governments. Uh, why it is important, right? You, you're saying how to make sure that vaccine is available for everyone in the world when vaccine development takes 10 years, right? What uh, Pfizer, together with its partner BioNTech, did during the pandemic, because it was such an obvious and uh, emergency, an obvious reason to do it at light speed, uh, we did it in 10 months. I cannot guarantee you that we will be always be doing it within 10 months, but uh, the new platform that I've mentioned, the mRNA vaccine, is uh, very much adaptable, and uh, that's the beauty of it and we intend to build uh, the future of uh, vaccination on that platform as well. And hopefully it will be uh, very flexible in order to meet the new challenges. Thank you. As you mentioned, obviously the, uh, the challenges of transporting, there are obviously certain countries that cannot have access to the vaccine either because they didn't have the means or also because uh, it was difficult to, to get it through. Also, there were so many countries that decided to, to keep it for themselves. Is, I don't know, uh, Professor Kunsulu, is, uh, is the idea of trying to, to, uh, to do uh, manufacture your own vaccine in the country uh, a good idea for people, for governments to try, as you yourself were part, was part of a uh, of the, uh, vac the Kazakh vaccine that was uh, being uh, manufactured in, uh, in Kazakhstan. Can you please uh, let us know what uh, your thoughts are? Uh, rahmet, uh, hurmet, uh, Astana, Halkaral, Formuga, uh, Good day, dear participants of the forum. Today, I am very happy to see you here. Here, among uh, Central Asian countries, uh, Kazakhstan was the first to make its own vaccine. We are not a big company like Pfizer, however, uh, we also uh, conducted and conducted different biological researches. Uh, we worked at uh, five uh, platforms. Uh, there we uh, prepare our vaccines. The first one is Kazvac. You know about it. This uh, is a known information. Uh, we conducted a big volume of work. It was also the instruction uh, from our government, and uh, we received the funding from the, the government. At that period of time, we understood that all the boundaries were closed. It was difficult to prepare different reagents. How, however, all together, jointly, we did all this work, and. Uh, 
It was a big scientific work from Kazakhstan parts, and we reached, uh, we managed to achieve what we planned. And also, due to the uh, right policy of uh, the head of state uh, of Kasim Jamar Tokayev, we uh, were able to do it. We built at a farm uh, factory here in Kazakhstan. And today, more than 6,000 vaccines uh, uh, were made. We uh, also had these stages like vaccination and revaccination. We provided this vaccine to some other neighboring countries like Kyrgyzstan. We uh, made our contribution uh, so that to address this challenge. As you know, over the last years, uh, we uh, had also different partners and our institute, our facilities, our people, specialists in uh, virus sphere, uh, they are working, they are addressing different issues. So we already had the experience, we already had the basis of the framework and due to this, we were able to make Kazvak, we also invented the other type of vaccine. We are still working in this area and uh, now we are making fundamental researches, applied researches, and we make uh, vaccines these days. So we make national vaccines, local vaccines uh, through our factories, uh, plants in Kazakhstan. We have prepared a lot of staff in this area and uh, the staff uh, training also takes time and uh, it takes a lot of efforts, but we made it uh, during a uh, short period of time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. There is uh, the um, part of uh, the community that doesn't receive any vaccine or any help actually, and it is the migrant. Uh, as we have a representative for IOM, what is IOM doing? What strategy is it implementing to try and make sure that the migrants are actually part of, uh, of the health system, getting the vaccines? Because at the end, they, they end up also, it, can, it is contagious, the sickness is contagious, and it, it, the whole population could be affected by that. Thank you, Afaf, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, yes, uh, to answer your question, uh, IOM has been advocating for the health of migrants, and this is the, the role of IOM is to work with member states and also with uh, interna other international organizations to ensure that migrants have access to health services. So if we talk about uh, vaccine distribution, this is one of the areas that uh, when, when we had this uh, issue about the COVID, when we had this pandemic happening, we were already aware that migrants, because of the status of the migrants in the community, sometimes they are marginalized from services, then we knew that there was a potential for migrants to be also marginalized from the vaccine distribution. Therefore, what IOM was doing at that point in time was to really advocate not only to uh, member states or to the, to the governments, to ensure that migrants are included in the national vaccination and distribution plan, but also to work with other organizations that, you know, the regional and the global organization that was forming in terms of the response to, uh, to, to the pandemic preparedness and also when that time when the vaccine was ready and it was ready for distribution, IOM was there to really join these um, international uh, organizations working together to advocate to ensure that migrants are included in the vaccination plan. At the same time, our role was in the country, we were monitoring whether migrants are indeed included in the national vaccination plan. And we did have some uh, <laughs> results that shows that migrants in some countries were either ignored or uh, they are in the plan, but it's not really clear to us that it's really, we are really talking about the undocumented migrants. For the regular migrants, migrants who have already, who are on the regular route, meaning to say they have their health insurance to help them, it is easy for them to access services. But a lot of the migrants in countries are undocumented, I mean, 
I don't know about the statistics in this country, but I'm sure you know that there are undocumented migrants in the country. And these are the vulnerable ones that we are really advocating for. So if you ask me what IOM is doing, we were there trying to uh, ensure that migrants are included, uh, are included in all the response when it comes to COVID pandemic response, but also to the vaccination campaigns of the government. Dr. Roboleta, as uh, obviously you've been, uh, you are also le leading a training program here. So what is your priority in terms of preparing the population to, uh, to face the next pandemic, the next outbreak? What are the steps that need to be taken? It's complicated and, and there are many steps. And one of the questions I always often get, get asked in my position um, is now that the pandemic is over, um, when do you think or do you think there will be a, a second pandemic? And my response is the pandemic isn't over. As was said by our colleague earlier, the emergency response portion of the pandemic is over and now we're in the recovery stage. So there's different stages when you deal with emergency response and pandemics. And now we really need to do exactly what we're doing now and taking a look and dissecting what went wrong. And one of the places that went wrong was with detection. There was a very long phase to detection. Um, but, sure. Um, one of the metrics that we're currently trying to aim in terms of um, detection is what is called the 717 metric. So seven days for detection, one day or 24 hours to respond, um, to report, and seven days to respond. And we're not there yet. Um, we have made a lot of progress over the last 20 years, um, but still, most countries, they're either not tracking this, um, or if they are tracking it, they're still over 14 days in just detection. Um, we have pandemics still. So when someone says the pandemic is over, we're dealing with pandemics that we're not doing a great job at addressing right now. We have TB, we have HIV, we have MPOX, we have animal pandemics. Right now, avian influenza is one of the biggest threats to spill over to human populations and we're not addressing that very well. So we are not prepared, but we are getting better and we are doing that through these trainings. And one of the best evidence-based trainings that we have that is led by the CDC in collaboration with a lot of other partner agencies is the Field Epidemiology Training Program. And we've trained over 18,000 frontline epidemiologists to be the first ones to identify diseases when they happen in the field so that we can reach that seven target. We also call are trained epidemiologists disease detectives because they have to, within seven days, identify the source of those diseases and try to stop the pandemics before they happen. And we have these little fires that we are responding to on a regular basis. Every month here in Kazakhstan, in other Central Asia countries all over the world, we have epidemics that have potential to become pandemics but we have a network that is addressing and putting out these little fires before they can spread. Apart from the government, and what, what can the individual do? Professor Almas, what can the individual, the person do? Uh, I mean, the governments are providing training and trying to, but what the sure. person can do, the normal people? I'm sure everyone doesn't want to catch COVID or anything else or any new pandemic, everyone wants to know what they should do in their lives to, to make it better and make sure they don't get sick. Yeah, sure. Um, as a famous French Enlightenment writer Voltaire said 300 years ago that doctors are those who uh, know little about disease, less about drugs to treat the disease and nothing about human being, which is unfortunately uh, tends to be true even today. And as uh, things complicate the matter is that that uh, there are more than 10,000 diseases that are known now to the, uh, to the medicine and about 6,000 uh, 
uh, drugs and medical intervention that exists, and things becoming more and more complicated and very difficult to deal with such information, uh, which is more egocentric, egocentric toward the uh, doctors and healthcare professionals. Uh, so the solution here is to somehow engage the public individuals as how individuals can can uh, be engaged in prevention of disease, which is of course is a cornerstone of uh, any management of disease. By the way, we always talking about management of disease, but let's talk about management of health. And health management is, is something that that individual uh, can do a lot. And uh, especially uh, the, with the advent of technologies, I'm very actually optimistic and positive about uh, the social media, although we heard of today a lot of concerns about artificial intelligence. But even like, you know, social media, uh, Snapchats and like, you know, Instagram, but even uh, chat GPT could be uh, designed such a way so that it will help to provide evidence-based information to the patients, to individuals, so they could be better armed to, uh, to uh, prevent uh, disease and manage uh, health. So this is very important, and I believe that we in the uh, process of, uh, of basically uh, uh, facing profound change in overall uh, healthcare environment, healthcare um, uh, platform. And with that, I'd like to point out that uh, very, very important to start from the beginning, start from the younger age. Uh, because kids are those who are a lot more, uh, on one hand, vulnerable to to that, uh, like you know, um, uh, incorrect information. But on the other hand, once you embed in minds of kids, like you know, what is what is it to prevent, what is it to be healthy? It will be a lifestyle, uh, lifetime um, uh, uh, support for for that child. And with that in mind, we starting now in Kazakhstan, in particular, we are very inspired by experience from uh, uh, Sweden and Finland. Recently, I traveled, and uh, I appreciate uh, the Honorable Ambassador of Sweden, um, Eva Polana, here. Thank you very much for your support. And now we are thinking of introducing uh, uh, health education and uh, specifically uh, school meal nutrition programs in Kazakhstan uh, with the goal of educating children so they will get lifestyle skills and uh, uh, they become healthy uh, when they become adults. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> um, thanks. I just actually wanted to add something related to that. So one of the things you talked about is social media, and it can be a wonderful tool. But I think one of the biggest threats to the pandemic and one of the reasons that countries that actually scored really high in preparedness did not do well is because of misinformation. And so these tools and AI can be excellent tools that can be used to our advantages, but then they can also be our worst weapons. And speaking about vaccines, we have some very efficacious vaccines. CASVAC, we've done studies with CASVAC that have shown that it was very effective. Pfizer is very effective. But the uptake is not where it needed to be in order to reach the effectiveness that it could. And for these vaccines to reach effectiveness, you need to have the majority of population taking them. Um, and right now, one of our biggest threats is um, misinformation about vaccines and a lot of vaccine preventable diseases which have almost been eliminated and not been threats are re-emerging as threats since the COVID-19 vaccine pandemic began. And so I think there is a lot of work that we need to do using these tools such as social media to mm -hmm. rebuild that trust among the population. So thank you. Professor Kunsulu, as uh, Dr. Roberta mentioned, the Kazakh vaccine was, is a good one, but because of misinformation, it wasn't, uh, uh, some people maybe didn't use it. So what can be done in terms of uh, um, basically educating people about science and making sure they are prepared in the future to face pandemics and make sure they're making the right choices. Thank you very much for your question. This is a very serious question. The first pandemic uh, 
was uh, not easy to respond, so we didn't have a lot of information. And the uh, vaccine was uh, prepared, uh, and uh, it um, we didn't have a lot of time to inform about uh, this new vaccine. You all know that Kazvak vaccine was made by us in Kazakhstan, and uh, Kazakhstan had vaccine, but it didn't have uh, such a big scale to cover the whole country because the information about vaccine was missing. So we had a lot of uh, different uh, informations and anti-promotion uh, of vaccines. So that was uh, difficult. And uh, vaccine, uh, there is always a lot of information about vaccine and a lot of discussions about vaccine. Some information says that vaccine saves lives. Some information tells uh, different things. Uh, so, of course, uh, we had a task to cover the population with vaccination, but uh, over the past hundred years, it happened for the first time such a great pandemic, and we were not ready for such a pandemic. And uh, now we are taking lessons from uh, these uh, days, uh, from this pandemic, so we need to learn from uh, this pandemic. So we should always be ready and we should always be prepared. We need to continue to develop our medicine. We have uh, a company which uh, makes uh, vaccines and uh, we want to say that our uh, research center of uh, biological safety deals with uh, different issues of uh, that area for a long time. We uh, cooperate with uh, the uh, World Health Organization, so we also um, conduct trainings on uh, pandemic issues. And for sure, we demonstrated how to um, make uh, this work how to uh, deal with these issues, what was done by the government, uh, how uh, it was uh, funded. So all these practices were demonstrated in one platform in order to provide um, true information. So within uh, this uh, forum, we uh, published a book for uh, this uh, topic and each uh, country has to publish its own literature about the pandemic. We will continue to work on these issues uh, together with other partners and we will share our skills, our experience. In this case, we will be able to fight another pandemic. I would like to mention also that we need to focus on the fact that our president, Kasim Jomart Takayev, uh, mentioned several times about the necessity to conduct the forums like this, because we need to cooperate, uh, we need to fight the diseases, and we need to um, make uh, biological safety as a priority. That's why we conduct our work, we continue to work in this area, but we need to focus on international biological safety, and we need to uh, enhance the biological safety all over the world uh, on the first stage. So we need to be ready, we need to uh, fight the next challenges. Thank you. Uh, the vaccines, what are the challenges as a company and, and uh, you are facing in delivering and uh, making sure that in the future we will have uh, such a, uh, we will be prepared and we won't have to wait, uh, if, even if it was very fast, but still. How? Spot on, spot on, Afaf. Uh, a, a very good question. As I've mentioned, uh, a standard period to develop a vaccine 
For example, Pfizer just had the FDA approved an RSV vaccine. It's also a respiratory uh, virus. It will be such a novel thing that it goes into a mom who is expecting a baby and then baby is born protected. So in I order to develop I think we will that, need the help later on of Dr. Roberta to right. explain that. Exactly, exactly. But uh, to develop that is, is, is 10 years, right? Uh, so it will definitely depend on uh, what happens with the next pandemic and what type it takes. Now, we will have to see whether this mRNA platform is going to be scalable or adaptable enough, flexible enough, in order to tackle the new challenge. Now, what we can do from the practical standpoint is easy. You, you collaborate with the regulators to make sure they do prioritize the life-saving and innovative drugs in the regulatory process without, of course, compromising the efficacy and the safety of um, people and efficacy of the product. You work with the government who are willing to back with funding certain projects, exactly as uh, uh, my colleague was mentioning that uh, the scale was not sufficient in Kazakhstan. It was very difficult to invest uh, a lot of funds in order to scale up the production quickly, despite the fact that uh, the, the vaccine was very much desirable, so governments need to play the role. Uh, and of course, uh, us as uh, uh, international manufacturers of drugs and vaccines, we uh, need to keep, uh, keep researching and keep developing. Now, uh, Mr. Sila also mentioned that surveillance in the country is key, where the new pathogens come up or uh, our colleague from CDC mentioned that uh, the disease uh, starts and we need to uh, come back on it as, as soon as possible, detect and come back as soon as possible. That is very important because the sooner we know the data, because science is all about the data, the sooner we know the data, the sooner we can start uh, making it and working towards the, the solution for, for the problem. And uh, again, now we have the, the skill set in order to roll it out pretty quickly and uh, efficiently, as it showed. Uh, at the same time, I'm sure there will be new challenges and surprises which uh, will keep us on our toes, but we are prepared for that. Dr. Sila, so what is the WHO doing in practical terms? You mentioned earlier, and I promised I'll get back to you to explain what are the practical terms that WHO is elaborating to face the pandemic in the future. Whatever recommendation we provide to member states, we try to be based on the evidence. Based on multiple reviews that WHO has conducted in recent years related to COVID-19 pandemics, more than 300 recommendations were given. I'm not going to mention all of them because we'll not have time, but the key areas where the member states needs to work further in order to be better prepared is to have stronger governance, better financing for health system, stronger health system and tools, but also stronger World Health Organization at the center of global architecture. If you allow me, just let me give some examples here in Kazakhstan, because we say think globally, but act locally. I'm very honored and privileged to work in this great country that has given a lot to global health. I have had an honor two days ago to be in Almaty uh, to meet the father of primary health care, academician Sharmanov, who inspired me with his vision. And what I want to say that if we strengthen primary health care. Yes. Professor uh, Sharman is laughing, just making sure that's your dad. Yes. So that's correct. we have a generation here of doctors here. <laughs> Please applause. Because by strengthening primary health care, by providing key information to the people, they would be equipped with better knowledge in order to respond timely to disease, but also to prevent disease. It rightly mentioned by Dr. Sharman that uh, it's important to deal with health, not only with disease. 
the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we eat, the physical activity, all these are components of disease. Another component of disease or determinant is political determinant of health. Do political leaders invest enough of having better health of that's why now WHO together with World Bank is working on so-called pandemic fund and we supported also authorities of Kazakhstan to submit a comprehensive proposal because this is the time to better prepare all, all these components that I have mentioned. So international organizations like WHO will continue also in the future to play this prominent role to provide evidence-based information to member states but again, I must stress, and also as my colleague from the CDC mentioned, we are not yet fully prepared. We are better today, but there is a lot of work remains to be done. And again, I would once again emphasize health literacy of people is key. What information they use for their own health. We will work with Kazakh authorities also to introduce the vaccine for uh, so-called HPV vaccine for uh, cervical cancer. And key is to work with the communities. It was mentioned also the health of young people. There are a network of health promoting schools in Kazakhstan, more than 1,200, in which we are working in order to set up a clear messages to younger generation that they own their own health. They are not uh, exposed to tobacco products, alcohol, or unhealthy diet. So they, they need to get proper information all the time. It's not enough just one campaign, but it's on a daily basis. Dr. Calderon, what, what is IOM doing to reduce the inequalities that are in, uh, being faced by the migrants population, obviously? IOM is, uh, is, uh, is one of the international organizations and now it's a member of the United Nations. So IOM also plays a crucial role in promoting social justice as well as also reducing health inequalities, particularly when it comes to migrants and displaced people. Um, there are some of the ways that we do this. We do this through advocacy and policy development. Uh, international organization, not just IOM, but also WHO and all the other UN agencies does this by working with member states and also with uh, uh, governments in terms of uh, advocating for policies that prioritizes social justice and of course to, be, to also address health inequalities. Also, IOM works on building capacities of, um, of uh, governments or particularly countries in terms of dealing with potential health issues and concerns, particularly when it comes to um, uh, communicable disease transmission between migrants and host communities. And also, uh, IOM, uh, through, its, uh, uh, through, its, uh, through its funding mechanism, as well as also getting funding from donors, as well as also uh, interested uh, governments and um, private organizations, we provide and mobilize financial resources to support uh, member, member states as well as uh, countries with limited uh, resources in terms of uh, implementing programs and interventions that address uh, their health issues and concerns. Of course, our mandate is really to focus on migrants and the health of migrants. And in so doing, we ensure that they are not left behind, but they are included in whatever health responses that the country has. So if we think about migrants, we also think about our migrants from our country who are going to other countries because we would like them to be included in the health services and for them not to be marginalized and also included in uh, several of the, uh, of the responses of the government. Also, we assist in data collection, analyzing data and monitoring and also uh, informing governments, particularly when it comes to health issues and concerns of migrants. And we work also with organizations like WHO because they're the technical lead in terms of health. And migrants' health is only part of this overall public health that they are dealing with. And of course, we also uh, try to um, promote partnership and collaboration be between governments and different sectors. Because when it comes to migration, you don't deal only with one country. You have to deal with several countries. And so you have to work with governments. And also you don't deal only with the health sector. You have to deal with immigration, labor migration sector, and several other sectors in order to ensure that 
health is integrated and included in the responses. There are also many other or, uh, things that we are doing, but you know, that's just to name a few because I know time's up. Oh, <laughs> so, go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, also in normative and regulatory framework, this is really the function of uh, WHO, but IOM is also assisting in the process by providing information and also by facilitating regional dialogues in terms of uh, you know, knowledge sharing and information sharing, and also in terms of uh, you know, creating the evidence or finding the evidence in order to feed into programming as well as also into policy development. And last, of course, is health diplomacy. Um, for IOM, we participate in global forums. We also uh, work with member states in terms of uh, when they develop memorandum of understanding, bilateral agreements, etc. We try to feed information to ensure that we are advocating for social justice, for migrants, as well as for the host communities, and also to reduce health inequalities. So yes, I, I think I fairly covered all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Caldrian. Whose responsibility it is, uh, Dr. Roberta, for, the, for, uh, for alerting the population that a pandemic is happening? Is it, is it the government's role? Is it the scientific uh, community? Whose role it is? I think in a way it's everyone's role to alert. If you are sick, you should be going to seek care at a, a facility. Um, when you're at a facility and you get tested, if a laboratory detects something, the laboratorian should be reporting. If it's a, a nurse or a clinician detecting, they should be reporting to their district health departments. The district health departments should be notifying to their provincial um, or state health departments and up to a national level, which then gets reported to this international governing body, um, WHO. And so all along, you need people to be reporting those steps so that we can reach that target of 24 hours. Something is detected, it gets reported to the WA Ministries of Health, but also um, veterinarians, um, also even informaticians, so people in information technology, um, so that we can all kind of work together because working just individually with clinicians, you will not be uh, prepared for the next one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reporter. What is the main... You want to ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. I was about to give the floor in five minutes, but please go ahead. <laughs> Provide the microphone. I... I wanted to ask Mr. Sila, it's a great, uh, thank you for the great chance to ask you a question. So my question is connected with my uh, job. I am a doctor laborant and the, my biggest fear is uh, antibiotic resistance. Because you know, after COVID-19, in our country, we used a very strong antibiotics, ceftaxone and so on, braids, uh, so, so it was very, uh, the last antibiotic that we use usually uh, in pneumonia and so on. So a lot of our uh, future generation can be, uh, will be without any antibiotics and any help with them. Uh, two or three years ago, we had in, our, in Kazakhstan a database where we put uh, strains of bacteria that are resistant for all antibiotics. We put what antibiotics are non helpful at all. Um, what kind of job you and what suggestions you have for our future? Because it is a big, and uh, one more. In our country, it is the biggest problem because we use antibiotics when we uh, clean up our water that we drink. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Thank you, thank you very much for your question. Indeed, antimicrobial resistance poses today one of the greatest challenges of public health, not only here in Kazakhstan, but globally. That's why WHO, together with other partners, is working on one health approach, because antimicrobial resistance is not related only to human health, but also to animal health. 
Worldwide antibiotics are used also a lot in animal sector. Uh, Particularly in Kazakhstan, we are training health professionals for infection prevention and control measures within health facilities in order that, because we know the most resistant pathogens are these that are created within healthcare, so-called healthcare associated infections. That's why we want to make sure that in each facility, particularly hospital-based facilities, they have proper procedures in place, and we are going to monitor through the national team, national experts that were trained by international in recent weeks in order to follow up regularly. And the second dimension that we need to work all together with health professionals is to increase health literacy of patients. Antibiotics should be used only when are prescribed by medical profession. It's practice. I don't know exactly how it is here, whether a person can get antibiotic directly to pharmacy, but in many countries they can do, and it shouldn't be as such. But also, health workers should have a clear criteria when, for how long, and which kind of antibiotics uh, should be prescribed. WHO provided all these guidelines, and they are, can be found also. But apart from guidelines, we will work on a day-to-day basis with Ministry of Health and other partners in order to, to address this issue. Uh, can monoclonal antibod uh, antibodies be the next step after antibiotics? Well, the, the science is dynamic. It's not static. I mean, all the research that is done in this field I'm optimistic that in the future we would be in better position, but only with responsive approach by each and everyone. Because health, also pandemics shown that is not only business of Minister of Health, it's business of each and everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sila. So, for the audience, those who want to prepare questions we, uh, for, uh, for our uh, expert, please have them ready. In the meantime, I'm just going to ask one question to everyone. If you have, what is the main lesson we learned? I mean, COVID, we were all scared. We were all sitting at home. People started working from home, not going anywhere. Shopping was a problem. We weren't meeting with the families. What is the main lesson we learned? Uh, if I may start, I, I think that um, a very simple it was said by uh, several speakers today. Uh, we need to first help the trust to our healthcare system when we are asked to DTV to diagnose, treat, and maybe vaccinate, if that happens, we should consider doing that very well. And we can only do that if we take responsibility for our own health, right? And in terms of the, uh, what we have learned uh, in the future, and Afaf, I think before we started, you said it, it should be with a, with a positive connotation, and, and I, absolutely loved the motto we used within Pfizer. We didn't publish it very much externally, but it came up about May 2020. Uh, it was three words, science will win. We didn't know whether we're gonna come up with a vaccine. We didn't know whether we're gonna come up with antiviral treatment, which also are out on the market now in some countries. But we knew that science gonna get us past that. And it's still my uh, favorite t-shirt to wear that science will win. Uh, Pfizer, and I hope it will in the future challenges that uh, uh, the world sends us. Professor Almas, what is the main lesson? Yeah, it's actually not, I'd rather see it not as a lesson, but more question. So I remember my discussion of uh, COVID-19 two, two years ago when I spoke to uh, medical correspondent of CNN, Sanjay Gupta, and uh, we discussed extensively the current situation. and. Actually, what struck me, his question, uh, we know that, that uh, COVID-19 affected mostly elderly and uh, those like, you know, disadvantaged and those who suffer from chronic diseases and mostly the, uh, those people who are, who are aged. Uh, and 
how would society react if that would be children disease, not not elderly? What what would be like you know our preventive measures? How would we treat like you know these patients? Uh, would it be different? That's actually an interesting question that uh, also kept in my mind. Uh, I think that uh, uh, it would be very interesting to see the approach that was taken in uh, uh, in Asian countries with uh, with uh, respect to elderly uh, and particularly Korea or like you know Singapore. We, we, as far as I know, they are very successful in dealing with this epidemic, or some Western societies. So basically, it's a very convoluted, very complicated issue, and that affects not only science, uh, not only technology, not only political leadership, uh, but generally society, how society deals with this. And uh, for me, it's, it's a lot of questions, and I would wonder if I get good answer to that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Almas. Dr. Sila? Well, the key lessons I think that uh, we learn from the pandemic is first trust. If, the, if there is a trust amongst community towards the recommendations that are given by government, we would be in much better position. The second is communication, but proper, clear, concise communication because very often we failed to translate science into understandable language by ordinary people. Sometimes we use very complicated language, very complicated notions, which cannot be understood. The third one is community engagement. It's very important if engage community from the beginning on decision-making process, on designing, and all actions that are taken, it would be much better and finally, coordination. If there is orchestrated coordination at all levels, starting at global, regional, and country level, we would have more coherent, more evidence-based, but very often it happened that some actions were taken by panic, by history, and just by, I mean, satisfying perception, not that they were made by evidence. Thank you. Professor Kunsulu, what is the main... What can be done better next time? In the pandemic, uh, in the problem. If uh, there were no pandemic, if there were no this disease, we wouldn't uh, improve uh, the collaboration between the ministries. So we made a conclusion that uh, due to this uh, pandemic, we were able to implement uh, new methods. So we uh, made the whole process from the very beginning until the very end to work with the population, to work with the ministry. So uh, that was a joint work and so we made it quickly and we made it fast. Me next. <laughs> yes, I think if there's one thing that uh, I have learned in terms of uh, what happened is, of course, thinking about the next one, we are thinking more about the global health preparedness. And this really requires a global solidarity. And uh, it, is, it is not just countries sharing their uh, excess uh, vaccine or resources to those who do not have, but uh, also this is particularly important because it addresses health disparities. And when we talk about health disparities, disparity, this is ensuring that uh, vulnerable populations worldwide have access to uh, services. And this includes also the migrants, regardless of whether they are documented or not. I think it's very important to consider a more inclusive approach and ensuring that uh, when we deal with problems like this, everybody has access and there's no one leave, left behind. Roberta. Thank you. I think um, one of the things that was really evident to me was our ability to adapt and to be so resilient. Um, you know, we are now at the stage where we can say we are in recovery. You know, a year and a half ago, we couldn't say that. I remember I was in the emergency operations center in Atlanta at the CDC when from one day to the next, we had to take everything remote. And we had never thought about how can we work fully remotely and have a response of this nature, but we did it and we were fully functional and kept running. And I think all of us here have in some way or another been impacted by the pandemic, whether 
we know someone who died or we ourselves are, are living with some of the long-term consequences of the disease. Um, we are resilient and we are moving forward. And I think that's what we know for the next one. If it does hit, even if we're not fully prepared, we are resilient. That's a, a very good note to now ta take the floor to our audience. So if you have any question, please your, raise your hand. Melissa. Thanks for the interesting uh, uh, speech. I'm uh, Mario Latini, I'm working for the World Organization of Animal Health. And uh, uh, so I've got a, a good panelist to, to make this question as a veterinary. These things like there's a uh, house that Dr. Norholt uh, said that the, the global preparedness cannot be done without veterinary, animal health, uh, veterinary and environment sectors. So, uh, and for example, for antibiotics, it, human seems very happy to keep antibiotics and don't take vaccine, at least in some part of the, of the world, while, while instead in the, for uh, every farmer is very happy to have uh, vaccines and not using antibiotics. So uh, there is something, that culture that we can share together and for example, uh, I would like to ask the representative of Pfizer. That's very important that uh, all the uh, private sectors put effort on, on veterinary si sides. I'm sure if, if there's someone from... Let me simplify so that. Are you looking for, for a vaccine for animals? I know. I just want to make I'm it clear. I'm saying that using... L l spending money in the uh, veterinary side is spending money on the uh, public health side. That's, that's the, 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 the important thing. Definitely, definitely. De de definitely. So uh, the, the, the is, the, is a consideration, but it's a question even. How can uh, pass this culture that not be all investment, all thinking about the human side and neglecting all the other Sure. Sides? Thank you. But it's, it's, it's not the question to Pfizer, but it used to be, because Pfizer spinned off a company called Zoetis about seven, six years ago, and that's exactly animal health uh, company, and it has the vaccines and uh, does have the treatments. I know of a company called Elanco, also out of uh, the US, which used to be competitive to Pfizer's uh, Zoetis, which is working on it, and I'm sure they are thinking about it very much, because we need to feed the growing population. We need to make sure nothing transmits from uh, the animals to human, exactly as you said. And uh, I, I hope it is well under, under control uh, by those um, respected companies. Um, uh, Pfizer is more focusing on human health, as you mentioned, yeah. Next. Hello, my name is Mari. I'm an undergraduate student here at Nazarbayev University. And my question would be to all of the speakers uh, with a sufficient knowledge in the topic. So what lessons can we learn maybe policy-wise from the, I guess, unique situation of COVID pandemic in the China? Because at the first glance, it seems to be that they handled the issue pretty, pretty simply. But nowadays, it's been a long-lasting problem that doesn't doesn't seem to be ending nowadays too because quarantine measures and severe lockdowns are happening to be continued so if you would comment on that i'll be happy okay doctor professor this is for you actually uh, i don't know i don't know much about china but i was also wondering uh, what happened like when when they um, released all of this and when they cancelled the um, uh, uh, um, epidemic measures uh, that was about half a year ago and everybody expected that the uh, rate of infection will exceed almost a billion uh, people and with uh, massive death and uh, with all these complications but we never heard anything on that like you know I don't know whether it's like you know uh, close statistics or uh, what's going on it's very very difficult to assess hopefully uh, Hopefully, uh, Chinese government at some point disclosed the, uh, that information. 
what was interesting, actually, I was in Stockholm recently. I was asking what the Swedish experience that when the government really uh, didn't take uh, any, uh, like, you know, strict measures. But at the same time, uh, like, you know, Sweden wasn't as bad as compared to some other uh, countries. So it's, it's a lot of things that needs to be addressed. And I saw a couple of articles in The Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine that are addressing what kind of measures were more successful, such as like, you know, lockdowns. How do we really need it, uh, lockdowns? How about face masks? How about vaccination? Which of them are uh, probably the most efficient or maybe uh, useless? So I think that the scientific community needs to do, needs to do uh, a lot of research to better understand uh, in terms of uh, uh, this epidemic measures that would help to um, to mitigate future pandemic if, or epidemic uh, situations. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Sharman uh, about Sweden. Well, we had uh, in the beginning a surprisingly relaxed uh, attitude in our approach from the government. <laughs> Uh, in the beginning of COVID and uh, later on when many people died in elderly care homes we were really seriously criticizing a lot of us and uh, also other countries our approach but but I think uh, Professor Sherman was referring to was that in the end now recently when statistics came out actually not so many died in the elderly people, as also Professor Sherman was pointing out in the beginning here, many people who died were really uh, uh, suffering already from these diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and being uh, very old. But we had big challenges, and we don't know yet if it was the right approach or not, but it looked better in the late statistics that we saw a couple of months ago than what we had in the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. One last question before we wrap up. The lady in the back. Promise I'll come back to you. <laughs> Good evening, dear speakers, participants. As a researcher in the medical sphere, I have one question regarding the golden period. Uh, as we see, we whole world missed the golden period of reporting this pandemic. And then there was three uh, viruses, like emerging viruses. This kind of pandemics is repeating again and again. But all the time, the world missed the golden period. How we can cope with that? And then the second question, we know that global warming and then the climate change can affect the human health too. So in, in, when we talk about migration, we shouldn't forget about the animal migration too. So in, in frame of One Health and, uh, and uh, international health regulations, how can we regulate, how we can cope with this animal migration okay. situation? Thank, Thank you, you let's leave much. it. Thank you, let's leave the time for, so who wants to answer the question? Dr. Roberta. I can talk about kind of reducing that time for detection and what is being done, and you are right. I think that time for detection and reporting was very delayed. And a system that relies on individual physicians to identify an outbreak is not a highly functional system. A system, what we've done now with the pandemic is we've built what's called syndromic surveillance systems, which are automated systems that are reading in the disease codes that um, hospitals are using. And they're looking at those disease codes and seeing, are we seeing increases, for example, of influenza-like illness in specific hospitals? An individual doctor might not notice that within their own clinic. They might just see a few cases, but if you're looking at it, kind of at a district level or at a country level, you're able to pick on those up. And when you have information systems that are built to do it, you don't rely on human error to miss those opportunities. I promise this gentleman, a last question here, please, in the front. Thank you, Melissa. As we start in a minute later, I think we can take this one. <laughs> uh, right, uh, thank you very much, Shalkar Adembek of Public Health Specialist, CDC. So I think uh, in our, our discussions, there are like a thread going on that it's not only a viral pandemic. It's a pandemic, psychological pandemic. It's a pandemic of fear. People were freaking out. It was a pandemic of people not knowing what to do. Uh, and it all comes to basically population, politicians, and everyone being prepared because we didn't have such thing for hundreds of years. And we basically forgot how to react to the things. The disease became 
unnormal. Now it's we are getting to it, but it was normal. So I think that we can track the governmental, the non-governmental organizational preparedness. There are already mechanisms that are working in that regard, like on the how we can measure and evaluate preparedness. But what we haven't talked about, I think, is the how we can evaluate the preparedness of the population. There should be some indicators, right? There should be some studies which actually track how the population is prepared and how the uh, shift of the effects of all this uh, intervention that are done by government and government organizations go on the population. So I think Thank that should be done as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for everyone. I just, uh, we're wrapping up, but I want in 30 seconds from each one of you a message of hope. We are living with COVID, but we are prepared for the next one. So, your message? I would just say trust science. We scientists are really working our hardest and have the best intentions to help stop um, epidemics in the future. Thank you. Well, I will uh, stick to my mantra. It's going to be, of course, uh, being inclusive and uh, thinking of leaving no one behind in terms of uh, access to um, healthcare, and that is for the migrants as well as uh, for the host communities. We have to conduct a lot of work, and we had made a lot of work, so we need to analyze all this, and now we have to make deep analysis of what has happened and we need to make a comprehensive analysis in order to be ready for the next challenge for the next pandemic we have to prevent the next pandemic and we make uh, we have to make a lot of work cross-border state private uh, share knowledge and uh, science will win. Professor Almaz. Well, I agree with uh, whatever our colleagues mentioned, uh, but I want to add to this is that, again, it's important to address chronic uh, non-communicable diseases and with the advent of new technology that uh, help with immune therapy of cancer, with uh, treatment of uh, cardiometabolic disorders, obesity, diabetes. I think we're in good shape right now uh, in, com in combination with healthy lifestyle. We can uh, make profound changes in overall uh, landscape of healthcare. Thank you. Dr. Siela. <clears throat> We need to be better prepared and to be ready to listen better to the concern of the individuals or the people and be ready to transmit right information to them. And on this regard, just to provide information, later this year here in Astana, WHO is organizing a regional committee with all member states of European region that will continue dialogue towards Thank better you. health for each and every one. Thank you. Thank you to the experts. Thank you just to quote here. And hopefully we'll see you next time. <laughs> and a big thank you to Astana International Forum that allowed this to happen. Thank you, guys. <laughs>